Welcome to Video Church. We've been studying, we've been looking at, and reminding ourselves of those things that really we already know. It isn't as though it were some new thing that's suddenly been discovered. It isn't as though we didn't already know the truth and the truth has set us free from the angst, anxieties, and anxiousness of the world, but rather we are looking forward to the time that Jesus comes again, the very soon return of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the very Messiah of Israel, the Jesus the Gentiles will trust in and have grace extended from to be allowed into the commonwealth of God and into the household of Israel. Because we're not all becoming Jews, nor are we all becoming Gentiles. God, in his manifest destiny for all of creation, has revealed that his people, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord to be saved, shall be saved. And he will name them a new name. He will give them a heritage that is with the Son of God, the Son of Man. For that is what we are to become, is children of the Most High God. Each and every one of us to become a son or a daughter of God, adopted into the family of God. Not like a Mormon theology that are as gods or become gods, but rather we shall be changed into the gradual likeness of who we are hanging out with, who we are studying and applying ourselves towards. That is Jesus. Now, in this New Year's Eve, we don't call it a prophecy update because we're not updating something we didn't know. We've been preparing for this all along. We're sharing in order to show what we know, really. And that is Jesus and Jesus crucified. Jesus and Jesus resurrected. Jesus who is coming soon for each and every one of us, one way or another. In the first hour, we talked about one of the biggest concerns that are on Americans' minds today, and that is, is America, where is the United States in prophecy? And we discuss those things that we realize that it's not about you, and it's not about me, but it's all about him. Because you see, a lot of us are ecocentric. We have this issue with being left out, left behind, forgotten, neglected. We want it to be about me and not about he or them or us. Rather, we're pretty selfish and self-centered in our desire to find out where is America. Because even if God said to us where America is, we wouldn't be satisfied. And that's why you find in prophecy, you find in Bible study, you find in the reality of a teacher from the left or the right or the up or the down or all around the town kind of guy, often telling you what you want to hear. We discussed that in the first hour, how even with our president-elect, you're being told sometimes, for some of you, what you want to hear. Hate, anger, avarice, malice, jealousy, greed, avarice, big business, you know, to make more money, honey, you know, to get it while you can, to be the gods of this world. Even as the Bible prophesied that now you are gods, but you'll die like men. And dare I say, that's what's happening in this coming new year. We have what we call a degree of separation. Before we all knew and we all had a pretty good idea of the American dream, we had a pretty good concept of what the forefathers who were just a variety of men, not one type of founding fathers that we say, oh, they were all Christians. No, they weren't. There were businessmen and rich men and poor men and people that were religiously oriented that wanted to build a utopian society and people who wanted to build a democratic society, people who wanted to build a republic, people that wanted to have a kingdom even. All of those assembled together to create the nation that we founded our generation upon, which was the founding fathers that are being changed into the image of something they never were. Evangelicals are famous for doing that now. And even in history, you know, there's a certain amount of Jewish things that go on. And, you know, we kind of did the same thing. You know, when we were like, you know, kind of recording things for the Romans, you know, you might want to look back and see Josephus, you know. You know there's a couple things going on there. But the point of it all being is this. 
God doesn't change, so neither should we. We should know what we believe in. We should be fully persuaded in our mind. We should be confident and competent to give to every man an answer for the hope that lies within us. Why? Well, really, because of this hour. Because we're talking about Jesus. We're talking about Jesus who has been changed into the corruptible image of man rather than in the incorruptible image of the Son of God. Jesus whom we have perverted. Jesus whom we have given over to our own ideas. Frankly, we call it American Christianity because it is deviant of actual, genuine Judeo-Christianity. If you haven't noticed over the years, in the Jesus movement, we knew what Judeo-Christianity was. It was built upon the principles of Judaism and Christianity because, after all, the Old Testament was more Judeo than it was Christian. But then along the way, somehow, we dropped that word Judeo. Now we have people that are running around that are claiming they're black Hebrews. They're American Israelis. They're somehow, you know, the chosen people. We're the 144,000 that Jehovah's Witnesses say. And yet the Bible declares each and every one of those 12,000 from every tribe of the children of Israel and lists them by name. How could you be the Jehovah's Witnesses when it's listed in the Bible? They argue it and debate it. We'll tell you. Frankly, I think that's pretty stupid. And that's what I think is hard for this hour that we're in. We call it the fourth hour because it's like the fourth watch. It may run over an hour like we talked in, you know, hour one about is America in prophecy? Where is the United States in prophecy? Or is America, where is the United States in prophecy? And we ran over an hour. It was about an hour and a half. And frankly, we came up with the actual factual statement that you can hang your hat on that no matter who tells you America is in prophecy, you can say no. And you can say yes at the same time. We told you that it's like looking into a crystal ball for you who you know like to combine horoscopes and and celebrations and genealogies and certain days and holy days and mix it all together and then you know go ahead and say well you know this is how I understand it and get all excited well I like to just simply say you know it's a way of calling it you know something for children to understand looking into a crystal ball if you look at America you will see the world Everything that happens in the world happens in America, literally. The land of America, the United States of America. So, the United States, the land that God has shed his grace upon, is being used as a microcosm of the macrocosm of prophecy. Meaning that you look inside and you can see, hey, there's people that look a little bit like the Antichrist. Hey, there's people that are terrorists in America. There's terrorists outside America, sure. There's false religion inside of America. Well, there's false religion outside of America. There's like little ten nations inside of America. Yeah, there's like ten nations outside of America. There's like Europeans and Australians and everybody else in America. Yeah, they're like that outside of America. Dare I say, everything that's going on in the world is going on in America. In a micro way, in a minutiae way, but it's still happening today. That's how you can use it kind of like a crystal ball. Now that we have a antichrist type figure ascending into the presidency who has based his candidacy upon hate and anger and division and strife and lying and cheating and stealing and greed and avarice and all the things we just now discussed, hey, you got another one coming, the real one. It happens first here. You want to see the previews, watch America. It's also, interestingly enough, that is what God said to us about Israel. We're not replacing Israel as being a timepiece, but rather not everything that happens in the world happens inside of Israel. You wouldn't recognize it because, frankly, most of you have these Israeli-made glasses on that you think that Israel is holy. They are a chosen people. The chosen people aren't the people that are in control, by the way. You know, Prime Minister Netanyahu does not believe in the New Testament. He believes in the well, you know, it's a real questionable thing what, what Bibi believes in because as we discussed in hour two about Israel, because we started with America, we went to Israel and we started talking about 
what is Israel? Where is Israel? You know, are they, you know, what are we doing with it? Have we become, you know, like glorifying something that's not what God said? Because the law and the prophets are going to come and chastise not just the world for the law and the prophets, but chastise the Jew for the law and the prophets. Why didn't he do what we said? We spoke of Jesus. And so when the two witnesses come upon the scene, they are witnessing to the world, but also to those who would believe inside of Israel. Dare I say that some of us Jews who have become saved, who are saved, and who have followed Jesus all these days, it won't be such a big shock to say to you that, hey, you know what? The nation is apostate. And for some reason, people don't see that now because they go visit it and they want to make it into a park, you know, kind of like, you know, Bible land. You know, you could see, you know, Moses part the water three times a day, you know. Bible land, Israel. We look at it and we send money and we say, ah, it's okay. Never mind that they're selling nuclear arms around the world. And they are. They're selling nuclear technology and isotopes outward to those that they think that they can use inward for their own benefit. A Jew is for a Jew. There's no doubt about it. I mean, Netanyahu will convince you of a lot of things and he said a lot of things that are false. Somebody's got to sell out Israel. And we discussed that in the second hour, how if he stays in office, he'll be the one. He'll be the Judas of Israel. We talked about also how in the third hour, I believe, I'm trying to remember which ways we went, because for me it was all, all six hours or seven hours that we've been teaching, it's all been one long revelation of the will of God, the manifestation of the things that God has said would come to pass, and then the application of them is very obvious around us, so we didn't have to invent anything, like some kind of Muslim Mahdi or Islamic, you know, Mahdi, you know, that somehow he's going to be that kind of Antichrist or this kind of Antichrist. We talked about the rapture and how there are a lot of things that are misconceived and misused about the rapture, even though there is a snatching away that's going to happen, a rescue, a type of the salvation that's going to come upon those who are caught up with the Lord to meet him in the air. Notice what it says, caught up with the Lord to meet him in the air. It doesn't really say snatched up and taken into the air. It doesn't say they're caught in the air to meet the Lord there. They're caught up. That doesn't have to be, you know, instant poof, dynamite, you know, let's just explode out of the scene and our clothes are left behind and we're, you know, appearing naked in the sky. Or that somehow, you know, these rotted clothes are going to leave behind where our bodies were, you know, and your tennis shoes are still there, you know, and that, you know, you see nothing in the rest of the part of those clothes that are there, but that somehow... We get a robe on the way. Somehow, I don't have a way of explaining this to you, but it doesn't say that. You know, I mean, I can say it how it explained to you and why it's not there, but, you know, it doesn't say that. You have to read it carefully, and if you don't read it and see it, you don't read it and see it. That's all I can say. You believe it, but you don't see it. Same thing with the idea of these planes crashing or, you know, the world falling apart. And then another place I heard somebody that come off with the rapture said that, Oh, Satan gets so mad because they were so sneaky, you know, and it stole it away and took it away like a thief in the night, you know. And, well, you know, a thief in the night is a good thing, you know, an analogy and a metaphor, and there's a lot of things true about that. But it isn't like Satan lost something, you know. It was just like he didn't know it was coming. It isn't like somehow, you know, ooh, you know, poof, that's the only way to get us out of here. What if an angel just walked up and knocked on your door, even as Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him. Is that not prophetic? Does not that sound like the rapture? Well, no, because rapture, we're taken in the twinkling of an eye and we're snap, bingo, bongo, bango, you know, gone. I don't think so. And so we discussed that. So I'm just telling you, you know, personal perspectives. As you are going to see in the year 2017 onward, we do hold to the fact that Jesus is coming soon sooner than you think he's right around the corner he's knocking at your door as a matter of fact if you would just shut up long enough if you would just be still long enough if you shut up yeah long enough if you be still quiet enough then you could hear him speak literally god is that close it is going to happen that one day is just going to peel back and you'll see god in the air literally the kingdom of heaven and men will fear but that will be during the great tribulation period if you're there, oh well, I don't think you're going to like what you see. Because according to the scriptures, 
Men will flee and they'll crawl under the rocks to be like cockroaches. Oh God, no, 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 no. And hide for terror. It's not the fear of the Lord, it's terror. Sheer, unadulterated terror. People tell me they see God all the time. Well, I don't think so. I think you see what you want to see and you hear what you want to hear. God has said certain things about these times that we live in and they weren't pleasant. Jesus wrote letters to seven churches that exist today. They apply to historic. And this is another thing that people get so mixed up about prophecy. Your Bible, <clears throat> the Bible you hold, you know, the book of books, the, in a, <laughs> what do we call it? We talked about it in the last few hours. Um, the infallible word of God, you know, or the infallible Bible, you know, the, the Bible that has not one mistake or one error, not one dot or tittle is out of place, you know, and I'll say, Really? Is that what God said? No. You see, <clears throat> there's an interesting thing that if it's the Holy Spirit that inspired the authors to write the 66 books, then what did we do when we had the Catholic Bible or the Masoretic text or the other textus that weren't Recepticus? Did we suddenly go, oh, now we got it. That was then, this is now. In other words, when you... <laughs> When you take your theological idea, no matter who you are, whether you're systematic theology, whether you're a Jew with drash and bidrash and other ways of interpreting the scripture, whether you do like I do, Textus, whether you do like I do with an integral specificity, it is where it is, the way it is, as it is, and God uses it thus the way it is written by use of his Holy Spirit to change that, what you're looking at, so that it fits for you, applicable to today, and that you are actually hearing God say what he wants to say to you, so that you would have the same spirit, that your spirit bears witness with his spirit, that this is the spirit of God speaking to you, because you're hearing it as though God were speaking it out loud, and he is, if you would listen. So really, the spirit of God makes written words become actual vocabulary, from God himself directly speaking as though you were standing in heaven and you heard it directly from the horse's mouth or Jesus is looking right at you and saying I signify by my witness John that these are the words you know blah 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 and you'd go okay instead of well we got to interpret it no you don't you don't interpret you allow God to reveal it big difference systematic theology a lot of prophecy is interpretation and application. Not God said it, that's it, period. Now, the evangelical cliche machine likes to say, God said it, I believe it, that's it, boom. Doesn't matter whether you believe it. God said it, and that's it. It's a literal that can be figurative and allegorical and metaphorical and simile all at the same time, while the Holy Spirit does that for you, to you, and in you. If at some point in time in your baby walk, you need to think of, you know, well, you know, Adam had them and they were, you know, like whatever and, you know, kind of like did they have belly buttons and, you know, be kind of simplistic in your view of who God is, what God is, and how he operates, then God may have you read it and you don't see all the blood and guts being spilled you don't see all the gore. You don't see all the other things that we know God did do and allowed to happen because of the times that they were a changing and it was so bad in those days. And that God is not mocked whatsoever man soweth that also shall he reap, even unto the third generation. People forget that part. You see, that literal statement, even unto the third generation, is an interesting concept. Third generation. We are told certain things about God and his way of looking at life as he's created it for us. And then also the curse as he's cursed us with, as he has also taken care of and removed the curse from us, so to speak. Not literally, but he's going to figuratively so that our soul and our spirit would survive, but our flesh is still under the curse. That we can look at prophecy unto the third generation. That should be a lesson for you because that's what we figured out in America and where it's located. We're not even three generations old, really. If you took it literal, three times 120 makes something like, you know, what, 360. You know, we're barely 200 years old. 
Now, you don't have to call a generation 120 years. You could say that's the age of man and call 40 years a generation, 120. That's still most of America's time that has even been in existence. As a matter of fact, you could say that three generations was about the time that we started to be influential in the world. <sighs> Enough of that, because we said from the beginning there were things that we're not going to repeat the basics that you already know that you've heard from the very beginning that you know Israel became a nation in 1948 we already told you that no as far as Jews were concerned it became a nation back in 1800 we started going into Israel buying land that was started by Theodore Herschel in the World Zionist Congress but do you hear that talked about in Western culture no you hear it in Jewish culture but you don't hear it in Western culture or in evangelical circles you might hear it by a stray prophecy scholar trying to make a point, but do you hear it as a absolute from a Jewish perspective? Hey, we're going to Israel. Woohoo! Today we have a nation. And that's what Theodore Herschel said. Today we have a nation. Over 120 years before the actualization of Jerusalem becoming the capital of Israel in 1967. So people that mess around with these times and seasons and play with numbers, they don't often think about where they're coming from so that they would understand where they're going. A Gentile at the time of the Gentiles is going to look at numbers and numerology in a different way than a Jew will with Gematria. He's going to look at it, well, that's ah, similar, you know, so, you know, do this, you know, but is there an exception to the rule there? You know, did you make a mistake? And that's what happens a lot of times when people start talking about gaps, you know. Christians have an idea that somehow in Genesis there's a gap, and Jews don't. Why? We don't see a gap. Now I'm told that there's going to come out a new book by somebody, you know, that people like. You know, oh, we like this guy, you know, he's blind. At least I think he is. Bill Salas is supposed to be telling, I'm told Bill Salas is going to come up with a theory. Oh, there's a gap between the rapture and the Great Tribulation. Oh, so we have another excuse to kick back lay back and not do what Jesus said. You see, there's a gap supposedly between when Jesus left and when Jesus is coming again. There's no gap. <laughs> it's a perfectly timed, well-oiled organization that is happening just as God said it would, to the day, to the hour, to the minute. The same thing is true about rapture and great tribulation. We're not gonna get into talking about uh, the man's book because he's selling it. You wanna listen to him? Go buy his book, attend his seminars, and you know, get what you pay for. We've never, ever taken any money in because, like we'll say in this hour, it's a different kind of Jesus some people are serving. You know, you got to pay for your ministry. You got to trust in, you know, your job. You got to trust in your life. You got to trust in the tithings, the offerings, the manipulations of sales gimmicks from advertising ages and days where we in America have produced a culture of sufficiency that is self-sufficient without God in it. Do you miraculously have God provide for you? Or is it just simply, well, yeah, God miraculously provided for me by giving me a job. Really, how miraculous was it? Well, I, I kind of, you know, like had this idea that, you know, I wanted to live in Indiana. You know, Indiana wants me, so I went there, you know. And then I woke up one day and I said, Lord, I need a job today. So, you know, I looked in the paper and I investigated jobs you know and I went down to the unemployment office and they said there's a job here and I went there you know and I said well Lord bless it you know and I got the job you know and it's been providing well on one hand God provides everything he provides the Sun in the sky the moon and the you know the stars and the moon at night he provides air to breathe and yeah he provided your job so you could see that it was God providing in some way distant but is that literally God miraculously providing for you? No, it's not, you know, all of a sudden, you know, at the last minute, God, like Chuck Smith teaches in the Holy Spirit series, well, you know, we were like, you know, at our wit's end. We didn't know what to do. We figured it's over, you know, that's it, it's done. You know, we gotta move, you know, there's, we don't have rent money. You know, we, we trusted in the Lord and that's it, we're done. And then, you know, a check comes from some parishioner, you know, that's the exact amount to the penny for the rent. Bingo paid for have you had that experience I have to put it bluntly we have never taken in we don't get we give we've never taken in tithing or money or offerings or sold books in order to get things you know to provide for ourselves we had to trust the Lord and we have had serious 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 my wife knows real serious bills 
that God has provided. It wasn't easy, but we had to trust him. Because you see, in this ministry that we have, which isn't about prophecy only, it's about Jesus and Vidivo Church being that it's the word of God by the spirit of God to the people of God, of the son of God, Jesus. We're all about Jesus. You knowing him and experiencing him in a personal and intimate way. Knowing that eternal life is defined as that which God has said, which Jesus said it himself. This is eternal life, that they should know me and know him who sent me. So if that's eternal life, that's what I want. It's not something about living forever. It's something about knowing God, period. We better get a handle on where we're going so that we understand where we're at when we got what God said he promised us. Life eternal, existing with the Son of God, the Son of Man. Being in his, as the Pentecostals like to push, presence well, I don't like them saying that because now they've taken a presence and they made it into something that's not godly, but is, dare I say, spiritual, but I'm afraid they've gotten into spiritism. Have you? Have you gotten into more of the feeling that you have during worship than you do about the feeling that you have when you worship on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday? Because, you see, it's not about spirit and truth when we're talking about going to church and getting it from the bombastment of all the speakers. Oh, yeah, kaboom! Everybody sings in tune because guess what? We're going to overload them from someone who does sing in tune. That's not how God looks. God would rather have a baby babbling on the floor, you know, looking at him, then, frankly, all the musicians and all the worship services and all the concerts and all the money spent in a worship atmosphere to create God in effect. And that's what's happened now is we have this God effect where people are saying, man, did you go to that service? It was great. The worship was awesome. Funny how Jesus got left out. Oh, I didn't mean that. I meant I worshiped Jesus, you know, of course, you know, but, but, but it was awesome. You know, he, God was there. Really? Was he not there before they started? Was he not there after they finished? Was he not there when you walked out the door and he's still trying to tell you something? In other words, we're not trying to bust chops. We're trying to get you to realize something that's true about God. He's everywhere all the time, every place, at all times. There isn't some place he isn't. That spirit and truth is what Jesus was saying to the Samaritan woman, to the woman who said, hey, you know, you Jews, you worship over here, we worship over there. And Jesus said, ah, it don't matter where you worship, you worship, period. Doesn't require an adus domini spiritus sanctus. It doesn't require saying omen, amen, amen. All of the different vowel sounds that everybody keeps creating and recreating in order to make it fit for them and their particular doctrine. The, fat, the sad thing is, is that God's going to judge you according to what you believe in, not what he said. If he did what he said, we wouldn't be having this second hour or this fourth hour about Jesus. And what we want to do is bring that to a realization for you. If you're doing what he said, if you're reading the Bible, if you are actually getting God speaking to you from this book written by God's Spirit, inspiring people to write it as it is, the way it is, where it is, about what it's saying, then you know this about Jesus. He doesn't carry guns. You know that. It's a fact, Jack. There is nothing in Scripture, nothing in the Bible, nothing about a sword being carried by Jesus so that he could use it. Never happens. He doesn't say go out and buy guns, you know, so that you can have guns and be prepared for the world to come. No, if you look at the first century, 300 years of the church, they did not lift one arm, recognizing that Peter was wrong in cutting off the priest's ear. Because Jesus healed him and said, no, they didn't live by the sword, but died by the sword. That's why Jesus told them before that, go out and get a sword. And then let the scriptures be true and let everything be fulfilled, that he would use that as Peter would use his anger and his violent nature to cut off and protect, to serve Jesus by defending him. When did God need our defense? You hear people all the time saying that they have to defend God for Christmas. They have to say Merry Christmas. After all, God might strike them dead. They have to defend God by putting God, you know, everywhere you can see him. Oh, let's put him in the bathroom, in the toilet, flushing it down, you know, like putting it in the water under there, you know, God approved, you know, God is here, God is there, God is everywhere, so we have to have him in prayer in school. Jesus said, don't pray in school. Do you know that? Do you know the facts of what Jesus said? 
Don't pray in school. Don't pray at a poll. Don't pray where you can be seen. That's why I know you don't know Jesus. If you do, you're in absolute rebellion to him. So either you don't know him or you are in complete rebellion to him. That's the facts. Read it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. These aren't recorded so that you can have, well, you know, that was then, this is now, and we can do our own Jesus. Jesus didn't get high. He's not the reefer, you know, on some kind of, you know, token magazine that's going to say, hey, you know, Jesus got stoned, you know, because he didn't. He's the son of God, the son of man. He said things, he did things, and he is known by those who are not called his followers <clears throat> by knowing exactly what he's saying to them. And they do know. That's what's scary. The atheist knows what Jesus said. They look at the Christian and say, why aren't you doing it? Mahatma Gandhi, same thing. Gandhi said, you know what? I would follow your religion if your people would follow what Jesus said. Christians don't. And they haven't. And they still aren't. America is the worst at it. We say we want you know, God in our classroom, and yet we want to do that by putting up a plaque on a wall? Isn't that an idol? We want our Ten Commandments put in you know, inside the you know, domiciliary of justice, our courthouses, and that reminds us you know, to follow God. No, it doesn't. It just means you get to look at someone being legalistic. The fact of the matter is, here inside is where the temple that is to be rebuilt is being rebuilt. Not in Jerusalem where you think that somehow the new temple is going to be wonderful and we're going to worship in it. No, you're not. The temple is in you. The temple is in me. It ain't going to be rebuilt for you to go and see, you know, hey, we get to go play, you know, kill them. Slice that baby's, you know, um, take that uh, ox and just whoosh, one quick swift stroke and, you know, spoil, spill the blood into the basin, you know. And that represents Jesus because, after all, we don't want to have the real Jesus. We want to have the shadow of things to come, Jesus. The typology of Jesus. People tell me all the time that they're going to sacrifice animals in the millennium. And I keep telling them, I'm not. You are, maybe. I'm not. I'm not going to see it. I'm not going to be a part of it. I'm not going to do it. Now, that may screw up your idea of prophecy. It fits perfectly with mine. Jesus is the sacrifice for sin. Period. Doesn't matter future, past, present, or whatever. There's no memorial service going on. Hey, let's do it three times a day, seven times a day for some of you, but you know, three times a day we're going to meet, you know, there in Jerusalem and we're going to kill animals and have a wonderful time. God knows we need more violence in the time of peace. When Jesus said, nations shall beat their swords into plowshares, their pruning hooks into, their swords into pruning hooks, nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The violent man will be put away. In other words, for a thousand years, there will be peace, even though there will be those who are not saved. They will live under a kingdom that is saved. They will have a perfect environment when people say, well, if I'd only known. Well, you will know if you live that long. And when you know, you'll still reject the only begotten Son of God because it's not what you paid for. And today in modern Christianity, I have a problem. I'm, people are expecting Jesus to come out and, you know, Follow them to the abortion clinic and bomb it or, you know, bomb it or do whatever they're doing in order to stop abortion. They expect Jesus to come out, you know, and somehow rescue the government when the government is upon his shoulders and he could just say a word. But yeah, somehow they're going to make, you know, the president or the Senate or all these people into being Christian so that they're doing what God said by being a part of the government. Is that what God said? Christians for the first 300 years were leaving the Roman army in droves. Part of the wonderful aspect of what God had brought was that people were changing from the worldview to a God view. I hear Christians all the time tell me, we need a proper worldview. I said, no, you don't. You need a proper view of God, and then you'll have a view of the world. And it's, that's Satan's, this is God's. I'm God's, they have Satan's, everything around you. My house, my car, my home, my wife, my children, my whatever, they are Satan's. Literally, Satan owns this flesh, and he can have this dead carcass, because that ain't going to heaven. But as far as the spirit and the soul that my wife, my children, or my family that is saved, that I'm responsible for and accountable for, that's owned by God. Poof! It's going away in a day. It may not be in the snapping and the twinkling of an eye like you think, but it's the way that I know. And so in the realization of what Jesus said, 
I have to ask you, do you know Jesus? I mean, I have to ask Calvary Chapel pastors that. How do you explain this? And they explain it to me, and I go, you don't know Jesus, do you? And they go, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I just asked you, how do you know this is true? And you have told me what you think, how you interpret it, what the, because they're expositionally taught, what the commentaries say, what Chuck Smith said, what maybe Romaine or what maybe, um, I don't know, Malcolm Wilde said or what somebody else said, you know, some famous pastors or what John MacArthur said or what they said, uh, A.W. Tozer said, although Tozer, you know, if you keep reading him, you'll find he said it, but then he qualified it by what he meant. But the reality is, <clears throat> they'll tell me why it isn't what it is, where it is as it is, the way it is. What Jesus said, you're in. No, 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 that's not what he meant. He meant be perfect, and that just is part of being perfect, you know, perfect, so you can't be perfect, so, you know, you don't have to go by that. We go by grace, not by that. Really, did you read the rest of the story? At the end of the chapter where he says, this is my sayings. Here's what happens if you do them. Not if you believe them. Not if you interpret them. Not if you sanctify them or set them apart and think, ah, well, in the sweet by and by, I'll get there, but I don't know why, but I can't ascend this stat, this ladder of what you're telling me. No, you can't. You can stop today and stop doing what you're doing because you're following the false Jesus, the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist is out in the world. It's in America all over the place. I mean, it's really obvious. That's why the world doesn't follow what Jesus says. We still have some examples of it, and people don't like those examples. Catholics. I don't like the Catholic Church because they have also a papal church. But are all the monks like the papal church? Are there not people like St. Francis of Assisi who didn't like even the popes and was frustrated by the popes and followed Jesus instead? Did you know that about church history? See, there's nothing that's true about church history unless you include all that the church has done from beginning to end. From the days of Israel being called a people to the days of the Catholic Church, the Protestant Church, all the different functions of the different protest movement that went on, even unto today with the evangelicals and the non-associative and the, the non denominational then the interdenomination all of it that's all part of us that's not something we can say well I'm gonna pick and choose my history like you know the founding fathers well I'm gonna take these 12 guys you know and I'm gonna forget about these other guys because they were atheists you know but we won't include them in our founding fathers rewriting history routine about America we just want to talk about these guys this is who the founding fathers were forget about these guys it was all these guys because guess what they argued and they fought and they didn't agree and even when they signed the thing they didn't agree some of them hoped it would fail. Read their personal journals and testimonies. They discussed some of the most disgusting things that could happen to the document. Two-party system was one of them. Matter of fact, Jefferson warned about it. Adams warned about it. Adams said the failure of this document that we are writing today will be if it boils down to just two parties in control and the people no longer represented. That's your founding fathers. And yet people are teaching the other things he said so that they don't get to the fruit of what he has said, which is we can't govern ourselves. We need God to inspire us by his governance so that he would give us what would work for the rest of the people that aren't religious. So we would have a society that exists for truth, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Because they couldn't say God's truth or the freedom of grace or the liberty that comes inside of Jesus because they had people that were non-religious and they didn't agree. So they took the God parts out. On purpose, by design. They didn't want to establish a papacy in America, a religious organization. They wanted it to be inspiration of the man recognizing by realization of the words that are said that he could have a personal relationship with God and be a part of the land that was being given to and given over for God shedding his grace upon. And I use that expression all the time because that's the only thing that explains America. It doesn't explain it by anything else because frankly, you know, there are a lot of things America does that are satanic. We are the spirit of Antichrist in our way of the CIA setting up all these dictators that now have come back to haunt us. J. Vernon McGee used to say that chickens come home to roost. And they have. They've come back on us. Terrorism is what we did to ourselves. We shot ourselves in the foot every time that we started a war. 
We brought the terrorists to our door. Literally. That's how it happened. That's how 9-11 happened. It didn't happen because, you know, somebody else did it. We did it to ourselves by way of our presidencies at different times supporting... Um, I wanna, well, supporting terrorists on one hand and supporting these uh, totalitarian dictatorships on the other hand. So the dictators are keeping the terrorists under control and then all of a sudden we decide, well, we need to clean up our act and let's get rid of that terrorist and put democracy in. Put democracy in and they vote for the terrorist. Where do you think Palestinian government came from? Yeah, same thing. Ah, they voted for it. What do you think Egypt did? They had democracy, they voted for a meter, not for democratic revolution. It didn't happen. Bush wanted it to. He looked around and said, hey, you know, let's give everybody the chance and the opportunity to have democracy and see what they pick. They didn't pick democracy. They looked at us and said, that's a failure, according to the way they look at it, because they're not seeing it the way you see it. So looking at and recognizing that the world sees things different than we do, what are we doing about changing our point of view? Who is this Jesus that we say we know? Who is this Jesus that we say we follow? Are we following the Son of God, the Son of Man? Or have we somehow turned it about and made him into something only man could invent? Only something that man could create? Only something that man could say was his own creation and not someone by way of the dispensation of God revelation saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And so I dare say, do you want to know if you know Jesus? I'll tell you. Do you want to know if you can have a standard by you can know the living God, the Son of God, the only one who can save you from your sins? Every day you need to be saved from your sins because every day, literally, you sin. You do. You'll fail. You're miserable. Your escalation is not an escalation of getting better. You're getting worse. You're in a devolution cycle, not a revolution cycle of somehow evolving upward, but you're devolving downward. The world is overwhelming you. You have to overcome. And how do you do that? In the sun. Only way you can be saved is by being following hard after Jesus. Taking up your cross and following me, Jesus said. So when God looks down and says, this is my beloved son in whom I will please listen to him, here's what he said. Do you understand this? Here's what he said. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Where's the army? Where's the Navy? Where is the Marines who guard heaven's door? Where are the football players? Where are the politicians? Where are any of those things in these things? Where is the rich man? Where is Donald Trump? Where is, you know, Bill Gates? Yeah, rich man. Where are you? Where am I? See, we asked that, where is American prophecy? And we left it hanging. But the fact is, every day, where am I? Am I poor in spirit? Or am I thinking I've arrived? Hey, baby, I got the rapture in a bag, man. I'm out of here. I'm focused in on getting gone, not getting done what God told me to do. Because on the one hand, there's going to come a rapture. There's no doubt about that part. As far as the scriptures be fulfilled, even if there wasn't a rapture, God would fulfill the rapture because he's not going to be a debtor to any man. So he would even cause some to be saved, you know, and poof, bingo, bango, you know, and do it maybe the way they wanted to, like snap, crackle, pop. They drop dead, and then for them, they saw a twinkling of an eye. They were changing. They were flying in the air. But here's the point. There is an actual event that's going to happen, and we call it the event here. We don't call it the rapture because in Hebrew, it's called Natsal. People don't realize that, hey, the rapture's in the Old Testament. I don't know where you are from, but I know where I'm from. I'm Jewish. So it isn't some Christian invention that's some kind of secret rapture that was invented by Darby or somebody in the later years. 
It's been around. You never went ahead and researched it. Even the Rapture Institute, whatever they're called, you know, I forget, some bunch of theologians that got together and decided to write papers and publish it and keep track of whatever. So they have a whole bunch of, you know, Christian theological papers based upon systematic theology, proving there's a rapture, proving this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, it's a nice read, but guess what? It's kind of boring. It's intellectual, and it kind of gets stiff after a while. But why didn't they find the rapture in the Old Testament? Because in the same way that Israel was blinded to the Messiah, guess what? Christians are blinded to Jews. Jews, you know, I mean, what can I say? You don't even bother reading some of our writings, do you? The sages, you know, kind of like, you know, some of the Jewish literature, folklore even, you know, I mean, we talked about rapture, you know, talked about Trinity too, guess what? It's not a new concept, it's been around since the beginning. You're not the, you know, chosen generation to reveal wisdom to everybody else. Wisdom didn't start at, you know, Acts, sorry, didn't happen that way. But God, in his marvelous way of doing things, has kept blind different people to experience the things that he wants them to experience. You can't see certain things because God doesn't want you to. Frankly, if you could and you did, you would be greater than Lot. I mean, wasn't Lot simply about <clears throat> a chess match between Satan and God? Here they're having a conversation and Lot's going, what the hell is happening to me? And hell was happening to him. Would you be faithful? Because you use Lot as a story when you get a hangnail or you get a you know tooth or you get cancer. And, oh, I got cancer, I'm Lot, you know, and God delivered me. What if God wanted you to die? Would you accept that? Kill me, God. I know him, I'm saved. <laughs> Kill me and spare them. That's what Moses said. Literally. Take my life. And let you be true, God, but spare them. We don't want your name to be sullied by those people. You save them anyways, but kill me off if you have to because of your righteousness. Moses offering complete death for his people. Are you willing to do that? Well, I'll jump on a grenade if I was in the army. You know, Really? That doesn't happen that often. They just do that in a momentary action or reactionary moment. Oh, I love my brothers. I'll die on it. They don't sit there and go, well, let me see. Give me a moment. Let me think about this. Let's say I got kids at home. I got a wife. I got a car. I got a mortgage. I got to pay that. You know, and well, I'm going to leave them without a father. They're going to grow up fatherless and probably wind up out on the streets, you know, and all that stuff. So, yeah, I'll jump on the grenade. Frankly, that's stupid. You know, I mean, I don't think you should jump on a grenade for your buddies. You shouldn't have been there in the first place. Why are you putting yourself in a place where God didn't put you? So, when we see these things, if we're not in these things, maybe we're not in Jesus. Think about that. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Is this for good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of man? You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. You're a light, not a flashlight. You're a light, not a spotlight. You don't go around beaming your light on someone and say, look, caught them naked. Oh, look, she was in the midst of adultery. Dare I say, if you don't understand this, but the, if the scribes and the Pharisees were even in that crowd, they were guilty already of sin because you're supposed to cover a sin, not reveal a sin. So if they were doing it, they broke the Torahic law, the law of Torah, the law of Moses, the law of man that God had given to them in order to become a people. So they bring him to Jesus, and they say, well, okay, fine, you know. He goes, without sin, cast first stone, you know, no problem. I don't have a problem with this. Then he said, neither do I condemn you, because the law was meant to reveal mercy. Whenever you're put into a judgment case, when you sit there and you look at the circumstances, you say, well, yeah, the law says don't spit on the highway, you know, and yet... You know, you feel bad about it. You look bad about it. And I'm supposed to throw you in jail for 30 days, you know, but you look like you're pretty banged up about it and sorry about it. And, you know, everybody around you, your community, your father, your mother, and everybody else says, he's a good kid, really, but he just kind of blew it, you know. And now that you're scared to death, maybe you'll learn from this. Okay, so you're forgiven. You're pardoned. Whew. Grace unto you. That's what the law was meant to do. Condemn you, yeah, but then as your judgment comes, extend grace. Grace for grace. 
Light was meant to be revelation of, hey, I am a sinner. Yes, I have sinned. Yes, I have, like you, issues every day. You know, for some people, they have, um, they can't go to the beach, like Chuck Smith used to say. If you can't go to, if you, if you don't like bikinis, don't go to the beach. Well, if you don't like the internet, you know, if you don't like porno, don't go on the internet. If you, you know, if you're having a problem with it, personally, all you got to do is put up a filter and you won't get any porno on your computer. Most of the time, some things still get through. But the issue is that even in society, our TVs have porno. Even in our day-to-day -day living, we have porno. Even in our thought life, we have porno because Satan tempts us with it. So... Don't try to be a legalist by saying, well, you know, blah, 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 you know, uh, ah, 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 ah. no, you're guilty because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So the light is self-revelatory. I'm the light of the world. I can see it in a mirror. The light shines back on me and warns me, ha, ah, I'm guilty. So pray for forgiveness. That's how easy it is. It wasn't meant to be some kind of, well, if you're really, truly, 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 truly with a big T and a capital R and a U-E too, you know, repentant, then you might be forgiven. But I got to prove it to myself first. It's not the way it works. It's not about you. It's about him. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is heaven. Think not I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets, but I'm come not to destroy but to fulfill for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law to all be fulfilled. And now we get the law. Because people say, well, Jesus didn't want to get rid of the law. He wanted to fulfill it. So, you know, we still got to do Sabbath. We still got to do Sunday. We still got to do Monday. We still got to do God have no other gods than me. And yet we have idols every day. I mean, come on. American Idol 